What we've done so far is that we've fit a very simple linear model, ignoring some of the details of the data, you know, the non-independence in the data, and treating it as independent. We fit a simple model uh, looking at the effect of attentional load, centered attentional load on pupil size. I just showed you the code for the model. Now I'm going to show you what you get out of this model and how to interpret what's in this model. Right. So first of all, uh, one easy way to summarize the output from the model is to use this built-in plot function. So the plot function knows uh, that you're looking at a, a stan object. So the fitted model is a stan object underlyingly, and it uses that information to print out the appropriate plot function. As you, as you know, in R, there's also this plot function for standard base graphics, but this plot function is working with BRMS output. Okay. So what this, um, this is the fit pupil data that I had fit earlier. And the things to look at here is that there are three parameters indeed that we had set up. There's the intercept, here's the slope. And I know that it's the slope because the name of the predictor, C load, centered load, is listed here. And here's the sigma parameter. As you can see, the sigma parameter is positive. The posterior distribution is ranging from in the positive, uh, positive uh, range. And this comes from the fact that I have um, uh, enough data that the posterior distribution is heavily influenced by the likelihood. Right? So what, what's going to happen is that the mean of this sigma and the variability of this sigma are going to be not very different from the, um, the mean that I would get from a standard linear model in the frequentist setting. Okay? What is more interesting for me is to look at the distribution, the posterior distribution of the slope parameter, because the slope parameter is now telling me what the range of variability is going to be in the pupil size when I increase attentional load by one unit. Right? So the intercept is telling me what? The intercept is telling me the average pupil size. Why? Because I centered the predictor. Once you center the predictor, the intercept has the interpretation that it represents the grand mean, so the mean pupil size, independent of any attentional load. So you see the advantage of centering now, right? And so what the slope now means is that when you increase attention by attentional load by one unit, the increase in pupil size is represented by this posterior distribution. So roughly speaking, the pupil size would increase by about 10 to 60 units, right, with every unit increase in attentional load. That's what the model predicts. Whether this is the truth or not is a separate matter, right? We are just trying to draw inferences from the data we happen to have, right? So what we learn from the data is that this is the effect of attentional load on pupil size, right? So what you see on the right-hand side are the four chains. The uh, MCMC sampler is now uh, trying to get samples from these uh, distributions. And what you're seeing uh, is that these four chains are sitting on top of each other. These are called fat, hairy caterpillars. And this is a good sign because it shows that the chains are landing on top of each other. And what that means is that each of the chains for each parameter is sampling from the same distribution, right? If you didn't have these, these uh, chains sitting on top of each other, that would indicate some problems with, uh, with convergence. And there are examples of non-convergence in the textbook. And of course, we explain how to deal with that in the textbook. But right now, I'm only showing you well-behaved models that perform nicely, right? So you can see what happens in the usual case. OK. So that's one way to summarize the output with a figure like this, right? Usually what we do in a paper is that we don't show the chains. One doesn't generally show the, the chains. One just shows the posterior distributions of the parameters and perhaps also a table that summarizes the results. So what are the important things that you can summarize for the reader when you're writing a paper? You can summarize the mean of the posterior for the intercept and the 95% credible interval. This is the lower and upper bound of the 95% credible interval. These are diagnostics about convergence that right now we don't need to worry about because we're going to fit models only fit those models that converge right now. So this is OK. We can, you can look at the details in the textbook later. But what's important in this output is that you get to see what the model tells you about the plausible values 
of each of the parameters. For example, the average pupil size would be about 701 with a 95% probability of lying between 661 and 740. That's what the data tell you. That's not necessarily the truth, but that's what we learn from these data, right? And so one of the great advantages of the Bayesian framework is that you can talk about your uncertainty about the parameter. Not just, you know, like in the frequentist world, we have, is it significant, is it not significant? That is a much less interesting issue. Much more interesting is, what is the range of variability of that parameter? Similarly, the thing that we are really interested in scientifically is the effect of attentional load right, on pupil size. And what this output, this second line is telling me is that for every unit increase in attentional load, there's a 34 unit increase predicted in um, pupil size. And my uncertainty about that is between uh, 11 and 57 units here. Right? So this is telling me how uncertain I am about this prediction. Right? So this is a very important piece of information because if you have sparse data, then your uncertainty will be much larger. Right? So you've learned a lot less from that particular data set. If you happen to have a lot more data, you will get pretty tight, uh, uh, these are called credible intervals, you'll get tighter credible intervals which are much more informative about your problem because they're constraining what the plausible values are given the data. And finally, we have the sigma parameter here with the, uh, the posterior mean and the 95% credible interval here. So that's an easy way to summarize you know, the output. We are writing, a, we wrote our own function that produces this short output. It's in the code that will be provided with this course, so you can look at that later, right? Okay, so one other interesting thing you can do with this model now is that you can study what the model would predict for future data, right? For Remember that in this, in this experiment design, we have either an attentional load of zero, one, two, three, four, and maybe, uh, Oh yeah, that was it, right? Zero to four, that was all there was, right? So five levels of attentional load. So what we can now do is that having fit the model, and we got posterior distributions for each of the parameters, we will just generate new data repeatedly using the posterior distributions of the parameters that we have. So what we are getting from the model now is future data, simulated data sets that represent what the model predicts future data would look like. This is a very useful thing to do because it gives you a good understanding of how realistic your model is relative to the data that you have, right? So if you get predicted data that is completely uh, divergent or very far away from your observed data, that's an indication that there's something wrong in your model specification. You need to go back and fix it. There are many examples of such wrong model specifications in the textbook, but right now I just want to show you how this would work. The code for all this is of course available to you. Uh, and so you can look at it later. So I don't want to distract you with the code right now. What I want to show you is that the observed data is this density plot, this black one here. These are the actual data points, right? And the blue lines that you're seeing, these are the simulated data sets from the model given the posterior distributions. So the posterior distributions are informed by the data now and the prior, of course, right? And so we are getting posterior uh, predictive distributions of the data right, future data sets given the posterior distribution of the parameter. This is for load zero, and you can go and now check for every possible load level, right? How am I doing this? I'm putting in different load levels into the, into the model, and I'm just generating data now. Because I have posteriors for the parameters, so I can just plug in different load levels, and I'm going to get predictions from the model, right? So for load zero, load one, you can see that there is some really wild data here, right? There's some really sharp distributions in the simulated data sets, but most of them are generally spread out, which is quite realistic. They look quite a lot like the observed data. Here also we have these occasional outliers, these strange, extreme, extremely tight distributions, but most of them are spread out again for load two. Load three is the same story and uh, load four as well, right? There's, there might be something going on in the data. There might be actually a finite mixture happening here, there could be two separate distributions that we might be looking at, but we are ignoring all that, right? We are just treating this data as if it's coming from a simple linear model. That's what we often do. We simplify our assumptions, even though there might be a more sophisticated model that would be better justified by the, by the data that you have. This is something that we discuss in more advanced chapters, but for now, this is 
as a start, this is a good enough model, and we will, of course, improve on this in future iterations, right? Okay, so that's a simple example of what you can do with regression modeling. You can add one predictor, right? Or you can add more than one predictor. You can have many more predictors. Of course, there are complications associated with that. But for now, let's think about the f situation where you add just one predictor, and you can use that predictor to figure out the effect of that variable on your dependent variable. That's a very standard uh, statistical modeling technique that we use quite frequently in many different areas of science. Okay, so in the next lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present another model now as an example, but this time, instead of using the normal likelihood, I'm going to use the log normal likelihood. The log normal has some small complications and subtleties that I want to illustrate with this example, so that's what we will look at next.